Chris Burns, and welcome to The Network, where we connect into a matrix of newsmakers to get to the heart of an issue. And watch out, they've got answer in 25 seconds or less, or else. Let's take a look at that issue right now. The Nile, one of the world's longest rivers, irrigates much of Africa, from Uganda to Egypt. It's also been a source of conflict and tension, and could be again, as Ethiopia plans four large dams. Water wars, potential or existing, could multiply due to population growth and global warming. The fight for fresh water in developing countries is a theme at the 6th World Water Forum this month in Marseille. Areas like the Sahelian Zone, the Middle East and South Asia face development with increasing water demands. The UN says around 1.2 billion people live in areas of water scarcity and 500 million people are approaching this situation. The UN counts 37 water disputes involving violence in the past 50 years. Says Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, too often where we need water, we find guns. NGOs predict a new series of conflicts if governments fail to deal with a rush for arable land by wealthier countries. Now, wired into this edition of the network is from Cairo, Hisham Kandil, Egyptian Minister for Water Resources and Irrigation, whose government aims to ensure its Nile water quota. Here from the European Parliament in Brussels, uh, Judith Merkies, a Dutch MEP and vice chairperson of the, wa the Parliament's Water Intergroup. And from Marseille, Loïc Fauchon, president of the World Water Council that is organizing the World Water Forum. He's also president of the Groupe des Eaux de Marseille, which is jointly owned by the French water giants Veolia and Suez. Welcome, all three of you, to the program. First, a question to all three of you, starting uh, with uh, Hisham. How dangerous is the tension uh, over these dams that Ethiopia plans to build, and how will the nations downstream, like yours, uh, how could they suffer from it? Well, uh, I think, uh, first of all, I should say that we are supporting cooperation and development in all the Nile Basin countries. Uh, we realize that uh, many of the Nile Basin countries need dams to, be, to build dams for generating hydropower uh, because of the hunger for the electricity. And this is something we need to support. If, uh, if any country wants to build a major infrastructure, it okay. is well understood and well accepted that that needs to be assessed jointly with the downstream countries oh, to okay. ensure that uh, any negative impacts are being mitigated. Right, exactly, jointly. Now, uh, there are other conflicts like these. Uh, Judith, can you comment on that? There are a, lot, a number of flashpoints that, uh, where water is an issue. How is the European Union and the Parliament looking at it? Well, water has always been at the base of war. And uh, uh, just as you mentioned that instead of water you find guns, it has been at the base of war. So if you, uh, you, if you, you cannot never own a river and not own its course. You have to share, which means that you have to make a treaty about its course. We have done that in Europe uh, uh, as far as the Rhine is concerned and the Meuse. Okay. And I think that that could be an example also for other continents. Loïc, you're, you're going to be at that water forum in Marseille. How much is this an issue at the water forum and how are we going to attack this issue? Yes, it will be uh, one of the most important issues uh, we will discuss. But, you know, uh, this situation you have uh, mentioned concerning the Nile uh, comes from uh, the changes uh, uh, coming from demographic growth, coming from uh, new kind of pollutions, coming from urbanization. And as the situation is changing, a uh, new, new kind of facilitations are necessary. Okay, the EU is the biggest donor in water assistance. What's the EU Water Initiative doing to address tensions and conflicts uh, like what we're seeing potentially between uh, Egypt and Ethiopia, what we've seen in Darfur, what we've, we're, we're seeing in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, conflicts that are very much based on water, among other things. Uh, uh, Judith, could you comment on that? What's the EU trying to do to try to solve these problems? Well, first of all, diplomacy. But secondly, we're starting a European innovation ship on water, trying to innovate in order to reduce water footprint and to get the utmost out of water for electricity or other, uh, uh, or other needs. Hisham, what do you think the European Union should be doing to try to solve some of these problems? Well, I'm saying that the, the EU are doing a lot. 
and they can do more in providing support to the countries of the Nile Basin and in, in the, in, in the uh, North Africa in terms of capacity building and in terms of, uh, of, uh, of technical support to improve the water efficiency and water conservation. Okay, Loic, what about building capacity? How can that be done in those regions? I would like to say that uh, it's very important for scarcity, uh, for, for regions we, which are knowing scarcity, uh, to have uh, more and, and more capacity. That's the reason the World Water Council uh, asked in the climate negotiations to place uh, water at the same level as energy and to have a, a packet okay. uh, water energy. Okay, uh, Judith, the EU Water Group says global investment in the water sector will rise to nearly half a trillion euros by 2020. Won't the private sector have to finance most of that? Where's that money gonna come from? Well, we have to, uh, the EU will uh, fund that and we'll also have to find private partners. But uh, uh, if the next question is whether water is going private, my answer would be rather not. Okay, Hisham, what's, what's your position on that? No, I, I guess I agree uh, with Judith that the water is not going to go private. Uh, the government has a role to play, has a role to play, especially for drinking water and sanitation. This is a human right, and uh, we should provide it free of charge. Of course, cost recovery is important, but we should not, uh, we, we, we don't support water pricing. All right. Well, Loic, uh, you are part of a company that is a, a private water developer. And there are critics that say that the Water Forum's main backer, which is the World Water Council, promotes privatization in the water supply. Canadian activist Tony Clark describes the World Water Council as a smokescreen for the water lobby. What do you think? No, that's, that's what they are saying since uh, 15 years. And uh, they're always there in the forum uh, to discuss with everybody. Uh, I'm here as a president of the World Water Council. And to answer to the question, uh, water is definitely a public resource and it's uh, uh, the governments and sometimes the local authorities uh, to lead uh, the history of water and to uh, find the good uh, uh, balance between three pillars, governance, finance and knowledge. Okay, uh, Judith, the EU Water Initiative is to get a new strategy at this World Water Forum. How can that strategy head off future water wars? Well, first of all, by changing our own footprint. The EU has a very large water footprint, about half of the United States, but still very high. We first have to show before we can become a missionary elsewhere in the world. So we're uh, uh, being more efficient. But for instance, we could also develop all kind of uh, uh, smart solutions in order to, to use less water, to consume less water, for instance, okay. in sanitation. Okay, last question. Worldwide, over one billion people don't have close access to safe drinking water. What's the worst case scenario if we don't move more quickly to fight water scarcity? Do you see widespread famine? Do you see mass migration? Hisham. Well, you described the worst case scenario. I don't think we'll go this way. I think with technology and cooperation and working together, we'll be able to uh, avoid this uh, worst case scenario that you're describing. Okay, Loic, what do you think? How close are we to disaster? Uh, I, I will, uh, I'm sure that my colleagues share the opinion that uh, in the future uh, we have to work uh, not only in the rural area against scarcity, but in the megacities and in the surroundings of the megacities. This is one of the main problems we have to solve uh, in the future. And uh, I hope uh, everybody who is coming in the, uh, in the next World Water Forum uh, will uh, bring its solutions and we will share it and transform the solutions in commitments. Judith, last word. Um, how close are we to, to disaster? Are we just whistling in the wind here? Are, are we really doing something to fight what could become mass migration and starvation uh, among a lot of people in the world? We already see a lot of migration flows in the world because of resources, be it water, be it money or other natural resources. So there is a real threat. In order to, uh, in order to avoid that, we have to share our knowledge. We have to innovate. And most of all, we have to show solidarity with each other. Thanks, Judith. That's all the time we got for now. I'd like to thank our guests, Hisham Kandil, Judith Merkies, and Louis Fauchon. I'm Chris Burns. And until next time, thanks for connecting with the network.